Hello, everyone, and welcome to Software Architecture Monday. My name is Mark Richards, and in this lesson, number 170, um, I'll show you managing code reuse within microservices. You can see all of my lessons that I've done in Software Architecture Monday at my website, uh, developer2architect.com slash lessons. Microservices and code reuse is a very interesting topic because I'm sure you've heard things like this. Within the microservices world, reuse is abuse. Share nothing. This is a share nothing architecture. And as opposed to dry, we have please repeat yourself. Well, let's take a look at the scenario within microservices. So we have all these class files and when we kind of convert things to microservices or identify microservices, uh, we kind of find all of the class files uh, that are basically associated with one particular function. And we simply deploy those as separate units of software. Oh, that's not that difficult. Well, unfortunately, everyone, that system rarely, if at all, exists because this is more likely the case. We've got classes, in other words, code functionality that's shared. All classes extend from A, that happens to be our application.cs or application.java, where everything stems from. Then these particular classes extend from B, these ones from D, these ones also from E. Over here, all of these extend from C, this group from F and G. Code reuse is a natural part of software development. I'm, my humble opinion is we can't get by without reusing code. However, what happens we try to do this in microservices. Oh, we identify those same class files that work really well as separately deployed functions, single purpose functions. But what do we do with all of this reused code? That's what I want to talk about in this lesson. You know, there's three techniques that I want to show um, related to, well, handling code reuse. Uh, the first is to replicate the code. Uh, let's say that I have this service entry point .java. Now, uh, this is a, a tag annotation that basically defines the entry point uh, into any microservice and the particular class file that acts as that entry point. And here's how it would be used. It's simply just a tag, a marker interface. It, it really doesn't, or annotation, um, it, it really doesn't do anything. <laughs> As a matter of fact, we could do the same thing in C Sharp by making a custom attribute that identifies this class, Payment Service API, as the entry point to that service given all the other class files there. Well, code replication really is what it sounds like. We actually copy that code to each repository that that service represents. This code is actually duplicated, not shared. It's actually copied to each of those. Now, this might seem crazy, but in fact, it is really good for code that is very static, like the annotations or custom attributes I just showed you. Um, there's really no functionality there. There's little or no probability that that code will ever change. These are the times to leverage things like code replication. However, be careful because if we do have to change the code to add functionality or to fix a, a, a bug, um, it will never be consistent among all of our microservices. And as a matter of fact, if we want to do more custom annotations, uh, these are just class files kind of hanging around. Uh, there's no grouping of them. Uh, so these are kind of the problems with code replication. Well, let's talk, take a look at another technique, and that's probably one of the most common, uh, shared library. So if we take code like this service entry point that every microservice needs, instead of replicating it, we put it into a custom shared library, a, a jar file or a DLL, for example, a gem in Ruby. 
And so now I'm going to call that annotations.jar. And notice now I can version this. Version 1 contains the service entry point. We really start liking this idea, and we say, you know, um, I'd like a marker annotation or a custom attribute to identify a service that acts as an orchestrator. Okay, we'll just add that there. Maybe we're using data services as a type of microservice that abstracts data. I, I did a prior lesson on that one as well. Notice the version of this jar file is increasing. So if we take a look at a shared library, this is what our topology would look like. So we take all of our classes and we take all of our shared code, group that into shared libraries. We create our microservices and now this is what it looks like. So now we start to see some of the disadvantages of a shared library. And that's trying to maintain this kind of dependency between a library and the corresponding services using it. As a matter of fact, I have here one, two, three, four, five, six, nine services and only six shared libraries. Can you imagine if you had several hundred to several thousand microservices in your ecosystem? and several dozen to several hundred shared libraries, it would look quite a mess. Uh, I don't even know if I'd be able to draw something like that. <laughs> so uh, the advantages of a shared library are the ability to version changes. It's easy to have a, uh, a, a context to be able to expand a certain notion or functionality in terms of maybe uh, date utilities or string utilities or annotations, uh, marker annotations, these sort of things. Um, and they're really good for low code volatility when we don't expect our code to change much. However, the trade-off of the shared library is that dependency management I just showed you, which is really awful <laughs> or can get awful, but also it doesn't work well in heterogeneous environments uh, of which a lot of microservices ecosystems are heterogeneous. If I have a logging.jar, I'm going to need a logging. Uh, uh, package, a logging.dll, and every other kind of language I need, and I start duplicating the functionality now. Well, there is one other technique I want to show you, and that happens to be a shared service. So instead of trying to manage all of these shared libraries, why not take all of that common functionality and put it into its own service? And that way, if I need that functionality, like a calculator or let's say authorization or some sort of auditing, I just simply call that service. No dependencies. Well, if we analyze the shared service, kind of option. We notice this works really good for polyglot or heterogeneous code environments. Um, we have microservices written in three different languages. Well, the shared service can be written in any language it wants to because it's accessed remotely. And if I have high code volatility, in other words, I change that code a lot, I don't have to retest and redeploy every one of my microservices. Well, this sounds fantastic. However, don't fall into that trap <laughs> because it's really difficult to version a runtime change. When I deploy that shared service, the risk is fairly high because I could break everything. Uh, furthermore, the other thing is what if that service is no longer available? That means nothing else is either. So I've got availability problems. Uh, I've got extra latency because there's network latency, possible security latency, um, possible data latency associated with that shared functionality. And as all of these services here start scaling, this has to scale as much to meet the demand. So there's a, there's a lot of negatives about shared service as well. But at least now, you know that there are three different ways of dealing with uh, what I will call this necessity in microservices, and that is reusing code and three techniques to be able uh, to do that. 
So this has been Lesson 170, Managing Code Reuse in Microservices. Thank you so much for listening, and stay tuned in two more Mondays for the next lesson in Software Architecture Monday.